don't know about you, I'm excited to be here today. This, this time of year, I love the Easter season. Um, it's, it's a great time, not just for what uh, we live out and what we believe, but it's also just, just a fun time of year. Um, I, I can't wait. A week from today is our Easter egg hunt, and there's just a lot of other Easter activities happening. I'm just really excited about it. Um, but this morning, I want to, as we talk about Easter, I want to stick one more week talking about Hebrews. My grandfather, he told me a story about a dog he had when he was real little. And his father would always test the obedience of his dog. He would get a nice juicy piece of steak and lay it right there on the ground. And he would command the dog to stay. And then he'd stay and he would back up. Now that dog is put in a very tough spot, isn't he? He has the choice. Do I disobey and get the steak? Or do I obey my master? My grandfather said that as kids, it always amazed him and his brothers and sisters that the dog, once he saw that it was steak, he stopped looking at it. He would keep his eyes focused on his dad. So it just amazed me. All he would do was, instead of looking at the steak, which is where the rest of us would be looking, no, he's look, the dog would look at the master. And he said, it's interesting how life would be different if all of us, instead of focusing on things that tempt us, we would focus our eyes on the master. Amen. The book of Hebrews, from start to finish, is a call for perseverance. It is a call for endurance. A call for you and I to refocus on the master. It's all about knowing the greatness of God and then taking that greatness that he has given us and living it out daily in our faith for others around us to see. In the book of Hebrews, we see in the middle of all of our trials, in the middle of all of our temptation, the author here is begging us constantly over and over again challenging us to endure to the end to keep following christ we must not quit we must never give up trials are going to come temptations are going to come but you and i we must press on throughout the bible we see the christian life compared to a lot of different things the christian life is seen as warfare we were talking a few of us were talking about that earlier today it's seen as a battle. The Apostle Paul says, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3, he says, You must, therefore, you therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Maybe some of you remember the hymn titled, Onward, Christian Soldiers. The Christian life is compared also to a marriage. You and I were forever, as Christians, we are forever united, married to Jesus Christ. He is, or I'm sorry, we are his bride. We're also in a father-son, for me, relationship with our Savior. He's the supplier of all of our needs. And we are his, what a, how great it is that we are his children. Christian life is compared to a wrestling match. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12 says, For we wrestle not, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places the christian life is also compared to the life of a slave paul himself the apostle paul says he's a slave for jesus christ says it several times in the bible including Gen or, sorry, galatians chapter 6 verse 17 we also see the example of a farmer as christians we work hard try to plant seeds try to produce a harvest throughout the bible You'll find our Christian walk, our Christian life, compared to so many things that push us to endurance, to press on. In our passage this morning, Hebrews chapter 12, we're going to find another comparison. Perhaps the most popular one of all, and we see our life as Christian men and Christian women compared to a race. This morning we're continuing our series titled, Jesus is greater and if you have your bibles with you turn to hebrews chapter 12 verses 1 through 3 hebrews 12 1 through 3 that's what you join with me this morning in standing it's only three short verses as we 
and we stand this morning, we are standing to show the respect that I don't deserve, that you don't deserve, but that he deserves, that our text deserves. Hebrews 12, 1 through 3 says this, says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance that race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Verse 3, considering him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Thank you, you may be seated. Now, there's a lot of theologians that say this section of Scripture probably should be in Hebrews chapter 11. Now, without diving in too deep, the, when the Bible was written, it wasn't broken into chapters. Men came along and did that. Um, so they, they, it was like a man-made system, just to kind of, without diving into that further. So there's a lot of theologians that say this section probably should be in chapter 11. Let me tell you why. This pastor begins with the word, therefore. Therefore, Why? Why? Because we just read all about these examples for 40 verses. Why? Because of the fact that our faith leads to actions. Why? Because of these great examples found in Hebrews 11, these great examples of men and women who show us how to live the Christian faith. Why? Because now, because of that chapter, we know what faith looks like. We know what biblical success looks like. Therefore, what does it say? We must race with endurance. The ra- we, I'm sorry, we must run the race Run with endurance the race that is before us. So, based on what we just saw, Hebrews chapter 11, you and I, we are called to run this race. We were just just saying about it, didn't we? The faith race, if you want to call it that. These men that we've just read about, that we study, they they ran it. They were blessed. They They had experienced faithful living. They endured to the end. A lot of them... Suffer persecution. Talk about that last week. We don't like to talk about that though. But they did and we will. But they all finished their lives spiritually strong. And now because of these heroes, that's what they are. These heroes of encouragement. You and I now, we are called to run this race. So this morning the author does his best to encourage us, to challenge us, to plead with us, to keep running that race. So this morning we're going to do some good old fashioned Bible study. We're going to break down our passage this morning. But the main focus, the main point I want us to leave with, the main priority that we need to remember is that we are called to press on. Every one of you, you could pray it up here and give a reason of why you should quit, why you want to quit. But let me encourage you, let our author encourage you to press on, to endure, to persevere as we run this race together. In our basement, we have a treadmill. Now, we made sure to get a really nice one, you know. But I can't have my clothes just hanging on any piece of junk. <laughs> and I do have intentions. I do. I, I mean it. I do have intentions to use the treadmill. And I really should, let's be honest. But whether I use that treadmill or not is my choice, right? I know I'm married, but so take that apart. Take, get rid of that. It's my choice. If I decide to run one, three, five miles today, tomorrow, that is my choice. If I choose never to run again on that treadmill, that is my choice. But let's talk about a race that we don't, as Christians, we don't have a choice. If you are a brother, a sister in Jesus Christ, if you are a Christian, which means little Christ, here today... If Jesus is your king, if he is your savior, that means you have already, for this race, you've already been given your number. It has been taped to your shirt already. You may say, well, I'm I'm not doing that good. That's okay. You're still in the race. So it says, what's the word say? Therefore, therefore, going back to chapter 11, since some of you, some of you are going to show your faith by being on mountaintops. Therefore, since some of you are going to be beat up and destroyed, that's just reality from what we see in the last chapter. Ripped in two, sawed in two, broken, beaten. Therefore, what does the author say? Let us. Once again, chapter 4 as well as chapter 10, he says, let us. He includes himself. He doesn't just give the message and then back up and sit down. 
No, he is on our team. He is with us. He's living this out as well. He's not just walking away. He says, let us. I'm with you guys. Let us. He's involved. Let us what? Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. The New Living Translation says, let us strip off every weight that slows us down. Especially the sin that so easily trips us up. Now, the author here, he isn't talking about physical weight, is he? He doesn't care if you're like me and your stomach's getting a little too big. He doesn't care about that. Why? Because he sees, he's talking about something far more important than our physical health, and that's our spiritual health. Our world around us, every commercial you see, everything you see on TV, everything around you, they may be obsessed with how you look. They may be obsessed about your physical, but God cares about your spiritual the author here is writing to these Jewish Christians, encouraging them, get rid of that dead weight. Get rid of the dead weight. They're holding on to the temple. They're holding on to the priests. They're holding on to the ceremonies. They're holding on to all the rituals. It's all dead weight. So what does he say instead? Throughout this letter, he's saying, that's why there's now a better priesthood. There's a better sacrifice. There's a better temple. There's a better covenant. Can you imagine running the race, trying to hold all the weight of our works? Can you imagine running a marathon with a, just a gallon of water in each hand as you run? Maybe you put a book bag on, just fill it with weights. Try to run a marathon that way. You say, that's crazy. Who would, who would even think of that? Who would do that? You don't want know who would do that? We would do that spiritually. We would. We wouldn't run a marathon with holding jugs of water. If we wouldn't run a marathon with heavy weight in a book bag, why would we run the Christian, our spiritual marathon, carrying all these problems, carrying all this baggage, all these things that weigh us down? There are things in your life, there are things in my life that are holding us back from being the men, the women, the teenagers that we are called to be in Jesus Christ. And they don't have to be just obvious struggles like pornography they don't have to be these obvious struggles like bitterness that you can't get rid of there can be good things can be great things just to give you a few examples maybe you you love to garden i grew up my grandparents um they just had two actually two gardens they loved it and maybe that's you maybe you just love to garden you spend a lot of your saturdays pulling weeds checking on your tomato plants your Cucumber vines, green peppers, whatever else you got out there. What happens? That's not bad, right? What happens when you get up early, 6, 7 o'clock on a Saturday in the summer? You spend every moment of the day, all day long in the garden. Go to bed 8, 9 o'clock, you're you're dead tired. You got to shower, basically pass out right into the bed. Right before you fall asleep, you say, I'm sorry, God, I just didn't have time to spend with you today. What about golfing? I only golf four, five times a week. What about video games? I only play six, eight hours a day. What about hunting? Some of us, I know a lot of us, like, some of us like to hunt in here. And none of, these, none of these hobbies are wrong. Whatever hobby you like, there's nothing wrong with them. The problem comes in when I put them ahead of God. The problem comes in when they become my top priority. We're called here, what does it say? Strip off, tear off, get rid of every weight holding us back. If your hobby is holding you back, what does it say? Strip it off. Those video games holding you back, watching sports all day, holding you back. Whatever in your life is keeping you from running the Christian race the best you can. What does the author say? Get rid of it. Throw it down once and for all. Organize your priorities. Make sure God is number one. And then what does it say? Run with, what does it say? You guys are, you guys are talking like Southern Baptists in the church. What does it say? You got to yell it. Endurance. It says run like endurance. Alistair Bag. <coughs> he's a great Scottish preacher. You hear him on the radio every now and then. He once said this, he says, endurance is a key indicator of spiritual fitness. The Christian life is a race of endurance. We're going to struggle, we're going to have uh, victory. 
We're going to have difficulty. But let me tell you, right now we have victory, don't we? We have victory now. You're gonna, when you cross that finish line, when Jesus is there with his arms wide open, that's victory, isn't it? But between now and then, between now and then, it's going to be a struggle. The phrase in the Greek, it literally says, let us run, and the word is agona. And the word agona means run with agony. With agony. I wonder, has anybody ever ran a marathon here? Actually, I think there are. Yeah, I was going to say, actually, I think there are a few people who have. Besides, now my marathon is like the fridge to the sofa, you know, one lap, you know, one lap. That's my marathon. But if you've ran a marathon, you know the word agony probably describes it pretty well. From the top of your head to the bottom of your feet, every square inch of your body aches. You feel like your lungs are going to burst out of your chest. Your legs feel like rubber. It's agony. It's a struggle. And that's the picture of the Christian life. We are spiritual athletes. But we are attacked from every side. We are attacked from every angle. Doing whatever we can to remember to live out our faith. Remembering this is our duty. This is our responsibility. In every race, there's a finish line, or a starting line, isn't there? There's a starting line. There's also a finish line, and the gun goes off. Do we just stand there? The gun goes off. Do you just stand? I'm happy. I got my number. I'm happy. No, you start running. You start making progress. You start putting one foot in front of the other. The question I have to ask myself, the question we have to ask ourselves is, are we making progress? In this race I'm running, my relationship with the king of all kings, am I further along today than I was last week? Am I doing better today than I was a year ago, five, ten years ago? Are you making progress today? We have to ask the how question. But that's great. We have to run this race. That's great. We have to run it with endurance. But how? How do we do it? And you, the answer isn't from me. The answer is right in your Bible in front of you. The answer says by keeping your eyes on Jesus. Amen. Keeping your eyes on Jesus. We run by keeping your eyes on Jesus. If you grew up playing sports, you heard the phrase thousands of times, keep your eye on the ball. If you're a boxer, you watch the opponent's gloves, right? You play football. If you're on the defense, you keep your eyes on the quarterback, trying to read his eyes. Where's he going to throw the ball? Where's he going to go? I like to play racquetball myself. And um, in racquetball, besides, you know, the ball getting smashed off walls and trying to dodge from getting hit and all that stuff, what's the rule? Keep your eyes on the ball. You have to keep your eyes on on the ball and while that's the golden rule in sports theologian Bodhi Bauckham and I've said this quote in here before nothing new he puts things in perspective for us by giving us a quote he says if I teach my son to keep his eye on the ball but fail to teach him to keep his eyes on Christ he says I have failed as a father that's pretty bold Failed as a father. The author, this author, Bodhi as well, is our author here today, is pleading with us. He is begging us. Please fix your eyes on the one who loves you more than you can fathom. He loves you more than you can imagine. Keep your eyes on the one who died on the cross for you. Pay the ultimate price for you. Keep your eyes, as verse 2 says, on the author, the perfecter of your faith. You see, the course has been set. There's a line. The course has been set. The weights now are gone. And so now we've also been encouraged, right? We just read chapter 11. We've been encouraged by these great men of God, great women of God throughout that chapter. And now we are called to move. We are called to take that step. Take the next step. But then we find one final example. Greater than all the other examples Focus your eyes, not over there, not over there, but on Jesus. The Greek here, it says, look away to Jesus. And I find that interesting because if you have to look away to Jesus, that means I'm focused on something else, doesn't it? 
If it says look to Jesus, I'm already doing it. No, it says look away to Jesus. That means he knows who he's talking about. He knows we're focused over here. He knows we're focused on these people, this stuff, this junk over here that doesn't really matter, but we're not focused here. So he says look away to Jesus. That means we need to get our eyes off our surroundings. Don't look down at your feet. Don't compare yourself with others. See, that, I, th- I think that's the biggest one for us. Instead of looking at Jesus, we compare ourselves. Well, I'm not as bad as this guy or this guy or this lady. So I guess I'm doing good. Instead of keeping our eyes there, we keep it here. We're not competing with them. They're brothers, they're sisters. If anything, we're pulling, we should be pulling them up, not pushing them down. You can't run well when you're staring at the ground. You're going to stumble, you're going to trip, you're going to fall. So what does it say? Again, look to Jesus. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Why? What's the theme of this book? Jesus is greater. Amen. He's a perfect example. He's a perfect model. He's a reason we have faith. And the example he gives us is when he finds his joy, when running his race. He believed in God. He never wavered. He never doubted. He was faithful to God's word. He pleased God. He was perfect in his faith. His joy in the race was so that he could see through the suffering, through the agony, through the misery, through the shame even, to knowing that one day he's going to be the right hand of God. I love what it says in John 15, 11. She says, these things I've spoken to you that you may, these things I've spoken to you so that my joy, sorry, may be in you and your joy may be full it's hard for my joy to be full of jesus if i'm worried about what everyone else is doing it's hard for my my life and joy to be full of jesus i'm worried about all my finances and worried about this and worried about that just thinking out loud if i was focused on jesus all those things that come up i'd be laying them here right isn't that where they belong as we close this morning I challenge you, I encourage you, I plead with you, as the author says, to focus on him. When I I study this passage, I think that's the most important part. There's a lot of great sections in the passage we talked about. But if you focus on Jesus, everything else, what does the song say? Will grow dim. Continue today, continue tomorrow. Tuesday, when, when somebody drives you crazy at work. Thursday, when the guy, the, the kid at school drives you nuts. Maybe when somebody cuts you off when driving. Focus on Jesus. Let us pray. Father, we come to you this morning. And Father, we, we come to you acknowledging that there are times when our focus isn't on you. There are times when our focus has slipped off of you and onto those around us. Maybe onto those things that need our attention at work, at home, at school, Father. I pray that not only will we see all of these examples in Hebrews 11, Father, that we will take them to heart, that we will see the trials, how they overcome, Father. But now, as we focus on our race, our journey with you, Father, I pray that you will lead us, that you will guide us, that you will direct us, Father. I don't know about the rest of my brothers and sisters, but I know I'm weak. I know that I desperately need you, not just tomorrow, but now, Father. Today, this moment, lead us now. Help us to see the errors of our ways. Help us to see spots where we can improve, Father. We love you. We praise you. Not nearly enough, Father. And we ask for forgiveness for that. As we come to this time of invitation, I pray there's one person here who's not given their heart, their life to you, that today will be the day of salvation. Use this time of invitation that you will be glorified. It's in your beautiful and holy name that we pray. Amen.